Good morning in the United States of America and good afternoon in Europe. A very warm welcome to everybody joining this session of our transatlantic virtual series, A Road to Election Night and Beyond. Uh, my name is David Deisner. I'm Atlantic Brookers Executive Director. Today's event is part of a joint initiative hosted by a vibrant network of organizations dedicated to transatlantic relations. And I would like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of our team and our partners, which include the American Council in Germany, the Aspen Institute Germany, the American Academy in Berlin, MCHAM Germany, the Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, and several renowned political foundations and institutions as Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, Heinz Seidel Stiftung, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, and America House, and of course also Atlantic Brücke. Again, a very warm welcome. Tonight's virtual discussion is entitled Knowing Each Other, Mutual Perceptions Across the Atlantic. Uh, in fact, we want to take a closer look at our German-American relationship and ask ourselves which larger trends, which long-term opportunities and challenges we can see in this relationship, a relationship that, uh, without being dramatic, is being put to severe tests. And it is my great honor to welcome our special guests in our conversation, Ambassador Dr. Emily Harbour and Ambassador John B. Emerson. Of course, our two speakers hardly need an introduction. Uh, Dr. Emily Harbour has been German ambassador to the United States since June 2018. Uh, prior to her Washington posting, Ambassador Harbour was deployed to the Federal Ministry of the Interior, serving as State Secretary overseeing security and migration at the height of the refugee crisis in Europe. In this capacity, she worked closely with the US administration uh, already on topics ranging from the fight against international terrorism to global cyber attacks and cybersecurity. In 2009, she was appointed political director and in 2011, state secretary at the foreign office, the first woman actually to hold either post. Ambassador Harbour, it's an honor to have you today on the call. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Ambassador uh, John Emerson uh, was named Chairman of the American Council on Germany uh, in 2018. He is uh, the Vice Chairman at Capital Group International and previously, of course, uh, and we all know him very well, he was U.S. Ambassador to Germany from 2013 uh, to 2017. In 2015, Ambassador Emerson received the State Department's Sue M. Cobb Award for Exemplary uh, Diplomatic Service, an award given annually to one non-career ambassador. In 2017, the Secretary of the Navy and the Director of the CIA awarded him their highest civilian honors for his service. Before, before going to Berlin, he was the president of Capital Group, private client services from 1997 uh, until 2013. And previously, he served on uh, President Clinton's senior staff from 93 until 97 as deputy director of presidential personnel and subsequently as deputy director of intergovernmental affairs. In 2010, President Obama appointed Ambassador Emerson to serve on the President's Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations. Ambassador Emerson, dear John, it's great to have you too. Thanks so much, David. And I always love being on a discussion with my dear friend, Ambassador Haber. Wonderful. So great Thank to have you, you have, have both of you here today. Uh, just one final housekeeping remark from my, um, uh, my side. Our uh, moderator discussion will last about 35 minutes, followed by 25 minutes of Q&A. Um, so we do have uh, more than 200 uh, people here on the call at the moment. Uh, we would like uh, you to make please use of the option to participate actively in our call. Um, at the moment, all the participants' microphones and videos are muted by default. Um, um, and of course, I, you know, I won't have time to answer all the questions, but we try to include as many as possible. If you want to ask a question, please use the, um, the F and Q uh, uh, function in Zoom or the raise hand button. We can also put you on air on audio. So if you raise your hand with a raise hand button, I will uh, try to include you. Um, now let's dive right into the topic. Um, Ambassador Haber, if I may uh, start, start with you. When we look back on the previous three and a half years, it has been tough to say the least. Um, has the German-American relationship suffered permanent damage, do you think? How stable is this transatlantic alliance in view of the still ongoing tensions in so many different policy fields? Well, um, let's have a look at the um, at, at the perceptions first. Um, what we do see is a growing divergence in how we view one another. A very recent uh, pupil showed uh, that about 26% uh, 
uh, of Germans uh, looked at the United States in positive terms and the comparable number for the United States says, tells us uh, that 75% um, of Americans think favorably of uh, Germany and a recent uh, Chicago Foreign Affairs Council poll showed that 67% of these Americans believed uh, that they benefited from the transatlantic relationship. So the divergence is obvious. It's interesting that it seems to be uh, linked uh, to a growing, si uh, a growing sense, both in uh, the United States and in Germany, uh, uh, that China as a challenge uh, and as a priority is becoming more and more important. And actually here, uh, the numbers match. And they seem to be linked uh, to the respective uh, view uh, of, that we have uh, of one another. Now, if I look at data samples, um, I always look at uh, context, um, at uh, expectations that are intrinsic. Uh, the history of expectation, the history of perceptions, the history of strategic thinking. They may not be reflected in the question that was asked, uh, but they are very, severe, uh, very strongly anchored in the minds of those uh, that respond to the question. And here I point to the following yardsticks. The first one is uh, that we've seen uh, over the past years uh, a series of moves that were considered disruptive in Europe and intended as uh, disruptive uh, by the uh, administration, uh, withdrawals from international agreements or uh, um, uh, uh, criticism of uh, structures of regional uh, governance or global governance and so uh, forth. And making the point uh, that these were partly deeply flawed uh, institutions or regulations or rules or treaties uh, that were actually uh, damaging uh, uh, the prospects for the United States to pursue American interests. Now, I'm saying that uh, because Germany obviously is one of the most globalized countries in the world. Uh, we are a medium-sized country and we depend uh, on rules and regulations and international organizations, flaws and all included, uh, um, because we depend on the predictability uh, and the transparency uh, of them. That's, it's our lifeline. So there has been, um, I think that is closely linked uh, to the polls because for Germany, um, the um, disruption means a, a growing sense of in insecurity. We may be uh, uh, oftentimes uh, too much wedded to the status quo uh, and therefore uh, seeing uh, less of a chance uh, if we have an Amer a strong American partner at our side uh, to address the flaws of international organiza uh, organizations. But that's neither here nor there. But I believe the insecurity or less charitably uh, um, uh, said, uh, um, being pushed out of the comfort zone <laughs> may have contributed uh, to the data uh, that I have, uh, I have told you. Also, um, expectations. Look, the questions didn't uh, reflect what is truly important in our relationship, and that is uh, we are democracies, we are committed to rule of law, we are committed to values, we are committed uh, to choices that we want to make, but that is something that is intrinsic. It wasn't reflected by the language, uh, uh, by the language of the uh, questions, and it was so evident and ingrained in our thinking uh, that it didn't come, uh, uh, that it wasn't reflected by the answer. And I think that's where the polls probably get the relationship uh, uh, wrong. And my last point is we've seen uh, monumental structural changes uh, across the world in the international landscape, in the international uh, 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 geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, architecture. That means uh, that Europe for the United States uh, will be less of a focus than it has been, uh, let's say, 30 uh, years ago. And uh, New challenges uh, have arisen. We've seen the, uh, the huge rise of China, uh, which poses new challenges as we see every day. Uh, um, and these changes will be mirrored in the change of the transatlantic relationship. Now, that's not a bad thing. Relationships are never static. They're constantly dy uh, dynamic as contexts change, uh, change, as environments uh, change, and as 
threats change. We just need to be, uh, we just need to learn to be comfortable with that. John, are you still comfortable or how much uh, do these polls worry you? I mean, we also see that more and more Germans are kind of open to this idea of equidistance, also to other partners, say China in particular. Does that worry you? Is that a sign of alienation or uh, do, do you think that the polls get it wrong as uh, Ambassador Harbour just said? Well, I, I mean, I think um, there's no question that polls don't reflect the entirety of reality as, as, uh, as Ambassador Haber suggested. I would argue that the difference is largely because she's doing such a great job as ambassador and that's why the numbers are up so high in the United States. Uh, but it's important for Germans to remember that uh, we have gone through, as, as, uh, as Emily just noted, we have gone through tough times before and come through them. I, you know, six weeks after I started, we had Handygate. You know, uh, several years before that, we had the Iraq War. Back in um, uh, a couple of decades before that, we had Pershing missiles. So we've gone through uh, difficult and challenging times, even in the, the post-war era, in terms of our relationship. And we've always been able to change, move it back, modify, what have you. I will say this, and I'm not sure this view is shared by uh, uh, the, the current administration, uh, but there is no question in my mind that a strong Germany and a strong Europe are very much in the national security interest and the international economic interest of the United States of America, very much in line with America first. And, um, uh, and that is something that I think uh, from a silver lining standpoint may emerge out of these difficult situations that we find ourselves in, in part because of tone and other things. Uh, that, um, you know, we're beginning to see uh, Europe coalesce a bit more. I, I, I was um, uh, I honestly very impressed with, after being somewhat distressed with the way Europe was initially reacting to the pandemic, uh, to see uh, some of the uh, changes adopted uh, by the EU in, in terms of uh, helping the uh, other member states that aren't doing so well. Uh, I think the way Europe coalesced in the wake of Brexit and the Brexit vote, and obviously there's a tense negotiation ongoing right now in terms of what things are going to look like after December 31st of this year. Uh, and there's been a bit of a coalescing in response to um, uh, some of the, the rhetoric and tone that's come from, uh, that's come from the United States. I don't think it's a bad thing if Europe, uh, in, with uh, clearly with Germany's leadership, uh, moves to a, a stronger and more independent, if you will, uh, approach on a number of issues. The one point I would make is this, however. I do think, and, and, and Emily mentioned this as well, I do think it is really important because of our shared values that we stick together when it comes to doing things like trying to make sure that China plays by the rules and play and trades with a level playing field. Uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, Russian interference in our electoral processes, when it comes to defending ourselves against cyber attacks from uh, whether they're, uh, you know, jointly, whether they're generated by uh, states or whether they're generated by non-state actors, and of course, when it comes to dealing with uh, issues like climate change, which uh, I think will become, uh, you know, it, it get the focus it deserves again once we're through this pandemic. So, uh, so the, I don't want to see a, a complete decoupling of Europe and the United States, uh, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's good that Europe is making some decisions on its own and moving forward maybe in a different, a direct, a different direction from which uh, the Americans might like. But uh, what's really important is on these fundamental issues that we stick together and, uh, and work together. And, and I put China at the top of that list. Both of you actually mentioned the, the common set of values that we really share in that transatlantic partnership. I sometimes wonder, have maybe in particular the Germans kind of uh, overstretch that value discourse a little bit too much. I mean, in foreign policy, we always have these two levels of discourse, right? We talk about interest, maybe mutual interest, maybe co uh, colliding interests, but, but also shared values. My impression or our impression, you know, uh, here at Atlantic Book often was that that discourse, particularly 
when expressed from a German perspective, doesn't really resonate anymore. It can, you know, it appears as, as if this is almost moralistic or that the Germans want to teach the Americans. But, you know, have, have we, in particular the Germans, maybe focused a little bit too much about that rather abstract discourse of the liberal order values, rather than really looking for really concrete fields of cooperation and mutual interest? What would be- Well, well I, I, do think, I do think that sometimes when you just use values language as such, that it just goes like this. And, uh, and, it, and it doesn't sound real, uh, but it's very easy to say, to talk about it from the standpoint of reality. It's about rule of law. It's a, about a commitment to a free uh, democracy. It's about a commitment to a free press and to, uh, a full, and to democratic decisions being made by a fully engaged and fully informed electorate. And it's about uh, human rights and our commitment to human rights. And I, I mean, it, when you make it specific, and particularly the rule of law piece. And, and I'd also say uh, a level of transparency in commercial transactions to look at the business relationship we, that we have. When you, when you unpack values, uh, then I think it uh, actually has more resonance and more meaning to folks. Thank you. Would you like to I add on that? react to that too? Because if you, you're right, uh, uh, David, if you actually say, uh, if, we are, we, if we'd be lecturing, and you'd be right uh, if we made uh, human rights and values uh, the exclusive linchpin of international politics. But diplomacy and international politics are usually very messy affairs. Values come in as they should, because that's about who we are and who we want to be, uh, about human rights, the way we want the world to see, um, but interests come in as well, and history, and history uh, and experiences with third countries come in. And there's no hierarchy. Um, they just exist uh, side by side, uh, and the hierarchy usually comes from context. Uh, that's probably a bit uh, a realpolitik, but that's how it works. Now, uh, ignoring it, you see, my, I started my career in Moscow. I served in Moscow a couple of times, and the first time in the 1980s. And I do uh, acutely remember how important it was, how important it was that we actually stuck to the script of choices and rule of law and democratic values, uh, um, because that informed uh, not only um, the Soviet side, how far it could go, but it also uh, um, defined the limit uh, and the extent of inspiration we gave to others. Doing, um, dropping that as a topic because we decide uh, uh, that uh, it will lead us nowhere is actually leaving those alone that we would like to support uh, and uh, telling um, uh, other actors how far they can go in, uh, in uh, in ignoring uh, um, a popular dissent. Thank you so much. Uh, be before we actually talk about the election, of course, everyone, uh, you know, probably many here in the call would like to hear your assessment of the, uh, of the campaign and, and how it's shaping up. Um, let me just ask um, one question in more general terms. What do you think should and have, has to be on the transatlantic agenda, regardless of the outcome of the, uh, of the election? What are the key priorities, maybe A, from a German perspective and B, from a US perspective for uh, our transatlantic future, say for the next two to three years? What really is, uh, you know, what are the key priorities from your perspective? Maybe Ambassador Harbour, you'd like to start? Well, the, the range of issues that are on the table, uh, some of them are quite old and we have to deal with them uh, no matter uh, what uh, administration is in Washington. They come with a long story from burden sharing, uh, to uh, uh, tariffs, uh, to uh, uh, the Iranian uh, dossier, and so forth. So they're on the table, and we'll have to deal with it. And actually, we have a lot of experiences uh, in uh, navigating differences or managing them, or even solving and arguing out uh, our differences. Um, one of the one key question would be, and I, uh, John and, uh, alluded to it, and so did I, is how to actually deal with uh, um, the international landscape of uh, organizations, institutions, uh, rules, and uh, uh, treaties. Now, mind you, um, the United States can well argue uh, 
that it will be better off in asymmetric uh, situations because in every single bilateral situation it will prevail because it is the single most uh, powerful country in the world. But no country is ever only in bilateral situations. Uh, and for a country like Germany, this rule doesn't apply anyway, because we would not be uh, in a position to prevail when confronted with powers that are stronger uh, than we are. For us, therefore, uh, the European Union, uh, that is uh, a, a union of uh, soon only 27, uh, is a lifeline uh, for standing our gra ground, for defending our interests, uh, and for uh, defending, well, what we want to be. So dealing with this, um, um, uh, dealing with, uh, I don't like the word very much, uh, but uh, dealing with multilateralism, which sound, once again, sounds very abstract uh, and uh, very prone to, uh, to lectures. But dealing with that uh, will be a key issue, uh, uh, is now uh, and will be a key issue. Thank you. I would uh, absolutely agree with that. And, um... Uh, just to uh, underscore the point, the advantage that we have over our adversaries, competitors, whatever phrase you want to use, like China, perhaps, like Russia, perhaps, uh, the advantage we have is we actually have allies. Yes. We have uh, allies and alliances that are based on long histories and shared values. And if I look at the uh, at both China and Russia, it's less allies and more transactional relationships uh, that they have. And in point of fact, I think this uh, idea that the United States is stronger if we just do mano a mano, you know, bilateral negotiations misses the point that uh, sometimes one plus one adds up to more than two. And particularly if you're, this is why I made the point earlier about China, if you're dealing with, you know, a potential market of a billion and a half people, uh, you know, as it's as China is becoming more and more of a consumer market, uh, and you've got you know 400 million in Europe and 300 plus million in the United States, we are going to be, and we have similar ideas about how we should approach trade, what rule of law means in that context. We're going to be doing a lot better uh, if we confront that uh, jointly, and particularly if we can engage Japan, South Korea, and others. This, by the way, was the idea of the TPP negotiations under the, obviously Europe wasn't a piece of that, they were a part of TTIP, uh, but, but that was the idea. And, um, uh, and then ultimately you set this framework and say, okay, China, you wanna play, you gotta play by, by these rules. So, uh, so I think the commitment to multilateralism, and it does need to change. And by the way, folks, by, you know, burden sharing is not going away with a new president. In point of fact, it was first raised by Barack Obama, who uh, you know, helped uh, negotiate along with the chancellor and others, the 2% commitment at the 2014 Wales summit of NATO nations. Uh, so that's not going away. The uh, idea that uh, you know, Americans are a little tired about uh, what's used as never ending wars, I would say more accurately, it should be, uh, it should, it's not never ending wars, it's more like, uh, consistent commitment to a presence that enhances our national security. I think that's what the troops in Germany are. I think that's what the troops in, uh, in Korea are. Uh, and, and in point of fact, with the work we were doing in Syria and some of the work we're doing in Afghanistan, you know, they're getting tired of that. There's gonna be a little bit less of that. I, I will say, let me just also address this issue of troops in, the, in Germany. The, the 35,000 or some odd troops that we have in Germany are not there to protect Germany. They are there to advance American interests. And that's not me speaking, that is directly quoting Ben Hodges, who was the three-star general who ran USER, US Army Europe during my, during my time here. And they're there to be a part of, uh, a, a critical part of NATO uh, and uh, are increasingly joint interests as it relates to, uh, uh, NATO and NATO missions. So uh, I just wanted to put that on the table as well. But, but these will all be topics for discussion. Uh, personally, I would love to see us get the trade situation right. We came very close with TTIP. We weren't able to bring it over the finish line. That is a big piece of unfinished business. And if can I may I, ask, sorry. Can, yes, I, can I add to that point? Uh, yes, uh, just two things. Um, one is, it's obviously uh, that on all traditional bilateral issues, uh, 
uh, where we disagree and that have either financial or economic uh, implications. Well, uh, the uh, economic crisis that we are confronted here uh, uh, with and Europe is confronted with uh, too, will probably uh, limit uh, the latitude uh, uh, for um, uh, compromises. Uh, and I agree with John, uh, burden sharing uh, will be a uh, center stage. Uh, because here uh, I point to a data that, uh, that I read over the weekend and that really, really concerned me. And this is uh, from a poll uh, uh, conducted by the Chicago F uh, Council of Foreign Affairs. I mentioned it already. And it said that a majority uh, of Americans, Republicans uh, and Democrats alike, um, uh, were uh, uh, a thought that troops should either partially or completely uh, withdrawn by Germany. Now, this sorry, got, caught my attention, and I called uh, one of the first persons uh, that was um, uh, uh, that was affiliated uh, with uh, the poll, and I asked him, "Why is that?" and is, are the data the same with regard to uh, Korea and Japan? And the answer was no, it wasn't. Uh, and his explanation was uh, that actually some of the narrative had got stuck. Some of the narrative that uh, Germany uh, was free riding and, uh, hey, why should we pay for the security of others if they don't pay? I'm not saying that this is the reality. I'm saying this is a narrative which apparently uh, uh, has has taken roots, and that we will have to deal with uh, by pos uh, by positions and uh, 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 handling uh, uh, security uh, project uh, um, uh, power projection by uh, by Germany. It will be a huge issue, and that is not only linked to numbers; it's linked to things we actually do, including uh, uh, with regard uh, in our um, uh, political relations uh, with uh, third countries. So. I, I'd, um, I'd see uh, our relationship with China and with Russia as part of a wider uh, um, a security policy too. Uh, John, if I may, I would like to ask one, uh, before we briefly address the, the, the campaign, I would like to ask one question to you as a businessman and a diplomat. Um, over recent years, actually much to the d dismay of the, of the US, European companies and especially German companies have started to increasingly uh, rely on the Chinese market. And it has, it's an undeniable fact that the well-being of the German economy depends largely on exports to China. Now, at the same time, we see that the EU uh, uh, drastically adopted an aggressive stance against China in 2019, uh, actually labeling it as an economic competitor, actually uh, a systemic rival. So uh, Germany is, you know, obviously in a dilemma here. Do you think that, or from your perspective, do um, you know, the Germans uh, name their adversaries, uh, their political adversaries, clearly enough. Uh, or on which fronts do, do you think Europeans and Germans in particular have, have to make a cl clearer signal and, uh, you know, that they are uh, alongside the United States rather than China? Well, I, I think it's really a question of being realistic. Um, I was uh, at a panel on a, a discussion on just this topic this past weekend up at Schloss Elmau and, um, uh, you know, and the whole topic about, you know, German engaging, German businesses engaging with China was a, a you know, topic of conversation. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not for the United States to say, you know, you can or cannot, Audi, you can or cannot build another plant in China. But I think that uh, German companies need to be realistic as they think about not just their short term or even medium term interests, but as they think about their long term interests, because I guarantee you the Chinese are thinking about long term interests. And in point of fact, you know, the more you engage without insisting on the kinds of protections that will make sure that you don't see your intellectual property you know, replicated and popping up six years later with a Chinese competitor that can now compete you at a lot cheaper prices. Um, if you're not going into it with eyes open and taking, uh, you know, steps to make sure those precautions are in place, uh, you and your shareholders will be sorry uh, down the road. And and so that's why I, I think, you know, notwithstanding, obviously, some of the uh, the tensions and the tone that, that makes things uncomfortable. 
that exists. I just think ultimately it's important uh, for Germany and the United States to sit down and figure out what we do agree on vis-a-vis -vis China, what we can work in terms of reforming the WTO, for instance, and, uh, and where we can bring pressure to bear. Uh, it, uh, uh, and to do it uh, together, uh, I think is in the interest of German businesses as much as it is of American businesses. Mm. Professor Dahabu, would you like to comment on that as well, role of China and the business sphere? Well, with regard to China, uh, I think we agree on a lot. We agree on uh, the problems of uh, enforced joint venture obligations on level playing field, uh, on uh, intellectual property uh, theft, uh, on uh, uh, security risks, uh, and so forth. Uh, that is true. We also agree uh, that China um, and the much more muscular approach uh, that China takes. Uh, it obviously has seen the crisis as uh, opening space uh, uh, for uh, a much more uh, uh, proactive and even aggressive uh, uh, behavior. That's a problem that we have to deal with. Um, so we agree on the strategic uh, uh, challenge we do today. Where we might have disagreements is on the underlying assumptions, uh, which in turn are linked to the level, uh, levels of ambition. I always ask myself what Americans actually mean if they talk about decoupling. Uh, does it mean uh, um, a partial rollback uh, of uh, value chains that proved to be risky in the, uh, uh, in the pandemic? Or do you actually want to cordon off part of the world economically uh, um, and uh, what is that? Is that the objective? Uh, and even if it's doable, is that going to produce more security? And uh, is that going to do you assume it's going to uh, reverse or stop the rise of China? Now, if that's the underlying assumption, I, I would not agree. Uh, I think uh, it goes far beyond the capacities that we have. Uh, we can not reverse or stop the rise of China, but what we can do and should be doing collectively is defining the environment in, in which uh, the rise occurs uh, and defining the terms of coexistence. And we can't do that alone. The United States can't do it alone. They need, and we need as many partners as we possibly can have in order to address the practical uh, problems at hand. And that's what we need to uh, discuss. And the under differences in the underlying assumptions are not a trivial thing. Thank you so much. I would now like, I mean, this is a bit of a, a, a sudden move to, to another uh, topic, but John, would you mind maybe sharing your thoughts on how the election campaign at the moment is shaking up? Of, of course, we are all you know, following that very closely, um, particularly you know, the, the debate. I, I hadn't noticed. Yes, well, you know, after, uh, sadly, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away a couple of days ago, the, you know, the, the debate has uh, even gone in a, in a new and different direction. Um, how are you following that? We are not advocating here for either side or either outcome of the election, of course, but just as an analysis, how do you see the election campaign shaping up? Well, clearly this is, I've been at presidential politics since uh, the 1980s, and this is unquestionably the most unusual presidential election, certainly in my lifetime. You know, obviously we have the pandemic, we've got the economic crisis brought about by the policy response to the pandemic. We have a national conversation on race and racial injustice in America. And then you slap on top of that, a Supreme Court fight in the six weeks run up to the election. Uh, and I just make three quick points. Number one, I think a useful frame for people to sort of understand what's happening in the election uh, is to look at the frame that both parties are clearly trying to bring to, uh, uh, to this campaign. Uh, as fairly well articulated during the course of their two conventions in late August. So Joe Biden wants this to be a referendum on Donald Trump and how he has handled these three crises that we're facing, uh, you know, the pandemic economic crisis and, and this national conversation on race. And, uh, and by the way, up until now, the American public has sort of seen it that way, which is why Biden tends to be leading Trump's in the, Trump in the polls. The Trump campaign's job is to make this a choice. Well, you may not like what Donald Trump has been doing, but let me tell you something. It's either Trump, who's really good on the economy, and we're going to need to rebuild our economy. And that, by the way, is the only area where he consistently outpolls Joe Biden. And this other guy, Joe Biden, is just awful. And what they've noticed is a lot of their attacks on Biden really haven't stuck. 
So now the attack on Biden is to say, if Biden's president, it's not really going to be Biden. It's going to be Bernie Sanders and AOC calling the shots. And so things like defund the police, open borders, uh, you know, that you hear from the far left, they're trying to put on top of Biden. And what happened with, so this is the fight, referendum versus choice. And, um, and what happened with the, you know, uh, very sadly, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is it has clearly put this election into the choice column because you are now seeing consequences one way or the other. And historically, social conservatives in America, the religious right, a Supreme Court fight is rocket fuel for them when it comes to turnout. And unfortunately, the left complains about it and is upset about it, but we haven't seen that comparable level of turnout. So that's, that's something that I think in the short term may play to Donald Trump's advantage, believe it or not. Second point, ignore the national polls. I mentioned them earlier, but ignore them. As a reminder, what matters is six or seven states. That's going to determine the winner of the Electoral College. And in our terribly uh, bifurcated uh, partisan political process, uh, there's a very narrow vote of swing voters, essentially uh, educated people who live in the suburbs, often, mostly women, educated women who live in the suburbs is the sort of one swing vote, voter demographic. So the campaign, and you, you get this from the rhetoric of both sides, is for sure they're trying to boost base turnout, their base voters, and then they're trying to get as much of that narrow slice of swing voters as they possibly can. And then the third point uh, everybody needs to keep in mind is this is not election day on November 3rd. It is election weeks. Mm -hmm. Why? Because as a result of the pandemic, you're going to have normally it's about 25% of uh, voters vote by mail. You're going to have over 60% of people voting by mail in this election. And the way vote by mail works is you get your, I do this all the time in California, uh, you get your ballot, you know, three to four weeks ahead of time. So by the way, in some states, people are already voting. So election day starts much earlier. And the reason I say it's election weeks is it's also gonna last a lot longer than election night. Why is that? Because in most vote by mail uh, regimens, uh, and by the way, we have 50 of them because every state has a different um, uh, system for this. If the ballot is mailed in and postmarked by the postal service on or before election day, it counts. So if you have close elections in some of these swing states, and remember that uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, for instance, Hillary Clinton lost by less than 10,000 votes in those states, you have a close election on election day, you may have tens of thousands of ballots that are coming in in the week or so after election day, and those need to be counted. And just to put a final little complicating factor on it, 70% of Democrats say they're likely to vote by mail and less than 50% of Republicans say they're likely to vote by mail. They'd rather vote on election day. In many states, the election day ballots get counted first before the ballots that are mailed in. Uh, some of them, they count them as they come in, but in many states, including Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, by the way, two of the swing states, they don't count them until uh, they've done the uh, election day ballot, which means that on election night, it, there will be a disproportionate number or the number of Republican votes will just dis be disproportionately higher than what the overall electorate in that state is. And the number of Democratic votes will be disproportionately lower, which means we may be in a circumstance where it looks like a Republican candidate, whether it's for the Senate or for the presidency, has won on election night. But day after day, as ballots be get counted, the Democrat uh, comes on to at least make it closer, perhaps even win those states. That will be a mess, uh, let me just tell you. Nonetheless, we all hope for a fair and peaceful uh, election uh, period, as you said. It's just actually no reason to stay stay up all night, right? I mean, we will do it anyway, but uh, <laughs> just have to be patient. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, until now, I would now include uh, some of the questions that have reached us here through the mm -hmm. chat function. Um, Maybe the first question asked by Matthew Konichnik from Politico. He asks, 
um, referring to the election, the support of many German politicians and officials across the political spectrum for Joe Biden has left the impression among many Republicans that Germany has become a partisan national actor. What effect do you think that could have on Germany's standing in Washington in the long term? Well, I expect uh, this is for the German ambassador to answer. Hey, I don't <laughs> hope you feel comfortable <laughs> answering it. <laughs> um, no German diplomat uh, uh, will ever take sides because it's not our job. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, job of voters who uh, uh, elect uh, uh, a government and a president uh, uh, and Congress uh, in a democracy. Full stop. That's where we are. This was a very clear and short answer. Thank you so much. John, would you like to comment on that? No, I mean, I think, uh, I think Emily put it uh, properly. Um, you know, look, in all of our countries, you have people who are favorites. I mean, Angela Merkel is probably more popular in the United States than she is in Germany, although maybe not now because she's done such a good job with the COVID crisis. But, but um, you know, that, that happens. And I think, it, as, as uh, the ambassador put it, you know, the key is how, how are you interacting with one another? And uh, I'll tell you, we were uh, assiduously staying away from, uh, uh, you know, any sense of playing favorites in German politics as well. You just need to do that. Thank you. So we are now meandering a little bit among, you know, all these different topics. I hope that's okay. Another question by James Bindenagel. He asks, can the debate on the 2% burden sharing debate narrative change to one of burden shifting if Europeans take more responsibility for their security through NATO logistics, uh, MENA relations and develop PESCO, EDF, CRRD, etc., rather than 2% capabilities can shift the burden as seen from the US. Is there a new narrative based on Europe taking more responsibility? Well, I expect that's also for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a very valid point. Uh, frankly, the 2%, uh, uh, the 2% have always been some sort of iconic uh, um, uh, chiffre for, um, uh, for engagement, but they were never, they're not set in stone as if this was uh, the only thing. Just look at it this way. Now uh, that we see the economic uh, downturn, of course, uh, the uh, relative um, share and burden sharing uh, simply by the uh, by dint of the shrinking uh, GDP is growing. Now, was that intended back in Wales? Certainly not. Uh, what was intended uh, was that European countries uh, took over a, a greater share of responsibility uh, um, uh, defense-wise, uh, military-wise, mission-wise, uh, etc., uh, than they did before. And they did it as a response uh, uh, to a, a massive uh, intrusion in, uh, in our European neighborhood, in our geography. Uh, so that's a fact. We should actually uh, uh, look at outcomes uh, and we, look, uh, we should look at voids uh, uh, that uh, emerge uh, as the uh, as the number of um, uh, challenges grow, uh, and not only in our own neighbourhood. So I think the, uh, what you described, uh, uh, which would also probably imply a greater European centrality in NATO, uh, is a response uh, uh, to um, uh, the shifting uh, uh, security landscape, and uh, it's the way ahead. Uh, uh, the fo exclusive focus on burden sharing. I'm not dodging the issue. I think we should. P promises are made, and if you make promises, you keep them. Um, but uh, it, the focus alone is really not getting uh, the problem that we are confronted with. Yeah, JD, I would agree with that. As you know, um, you know, in uh, during our time as well uh, in Germany and Berlin, the push was on was really on the substance. Of, of what you addressed, of what uh, Emily's talking about. It was uh, the 2% is just sort of one of many means to, of getting there. And I think this, this focus on it risks elevating form over substance, um, and uh, which is something I think we all have to be cautious of. But at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. That's where we need to get, uh, and that's what's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question by um, one of our participants, Tobias Schwartz. He asks actually two questions. The first one is how much of the current underlying, not just tone, 
uh, problems in transatlantic relations can be attributed to America not being able to properly discount a future in which it can no, long, no longer uh, largely set the global rules for the game and needs a level playing field itself. That's the first question. And the second one is uh, referring to the internal uh, or domestic situation in the US. How much does the social division in the US limit its ability to act uh, strategically, short, medium, long term? Well, why don't I take the second question and, and Ambassador yes. Haber can take the first. I, I, I think it, um, I, you know, I, I actually think the social division in the United States is reflective of the fact that we've never fully and properly confronted our history in a way that, um, uh, it, it, honestly, in the way that took a couple of generations to get there, been the way Germany has been doing uh, with regard to the Holocaust. And, um, and these are issues and challenges that have been with us for a long time, that, that it will probably continue to be with us for a long time until we really do step up and, and adequately confront it. Um, so, I mean, I don't see it as being debilitating in the sense of our international relations. I do see it as uh, something that is increasingly um, having an impact in not just our domestic politics, but the way we live our lives. I was absolutely struck. If you had told me, uh, you know, three, four months ago that uh, you would see every major company in America engaging in a diversity and inclusion initiative, that you'd see uh, um, a literally uh, conversations within corporate America about uh, embracing the concepts of Black Lives Matter, uh, I would have said, you know, what happened to, to make that come about? Uh, so it's pretty, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. And, um, uh, and I think ultimately will be uh, very positive for us if we stay on it and don't just give it lip service and then forget about what the real issue is here. Mm. Well, on the first question, if I understood it correctly, the question, uh, uh, was, is the current tonality in international affairs uh, a, a reflection uh, of um, uh, an international landscape that has changed uh, to America's uh, and the West's disadvantage? Uh, and, well, I don't know. Um, I can always analyze how things happen, but why and what the psychological uh, uh, triggers are, that's very difficult to define. Uh, um, I'd say this, there's a, a, a broad understanding uh, that uh, America has been overextended uh, militarily. Uh, once again, returning to the Chicago Foreign Affairs poll, uh, I thought it was interesting that a, a strong majority, 67%, uh, said uh, the transatlantic relationship benefits uh, uh, the United States but there was also um, a large sense that in military terms, uh, uh, there was too much uh, exposure. So uh, that will reflect uh, not only this uh, what this administration does, it will also inform uh, uh, the policy decisions uh, of, another, uh, uh, of another administration that will certainly at least uh, uh, it's what it publics, uh, what uh, what the the campaign publicly says uh, would choose a different uh, tonality, uh, but the uh, structural triggering reasons uh, for um, making decisions uh, to bring people home uh, that uh, that would be uh, there in any event because it's uh, it it's taken roots in uh, the constituents in in a large part of the electorate. Thank you. Uh, we actually have a number of questions, all, um, you know, again, referring to the, to the election and the handing over of power and um, many questions go in the same direction asking, um, do, do you think that, um, that, that this um, a transition of power will be, will be peaceful? Uh, you know, uh, we have talked about common values and of course, you know, the democratic value of a fair and, uh, and, and a peaceful election is certainly a democratic value. Um, uh, John, how, how do you see it? Despite the fact that this might be a mess and will all take very long, um, do you think, you know, what would be scenarios? Can it actually be that messy that we, that we see a, a, a real disruption here in that process of handing over power and that maybe, you know, the uh, incumbent president might not see a reason to leave? 
Well, it, it, look, there, there are all sorts of war gaming going on. Uh, you know, the Brennan Center at uh, NYU just uh, had an exercise about what could happen. What if the president doesn't leave or whatever? I, I tend to think a lot of that's pretty overwrought. Um, I do worry about a period of time when we're trying to count ballots. You have a president who's already laying the groundwork for saying that vote by mail is fraudulent and uh, can't be trusted and the election's being stolen and so on and so forth. Um, and you could have a, on the streets sort of a, uh, a potentially volatile mix of people out there. But I think by and large, you'll, you'll see people peacefully protesting. You may have incidents of tragically of violence as we've seen in, in, in the past months, but those are very uh, limited uh, incidents of violence. By and large, these protests have been, you know, huge, massively peaceful. Uh, and I honestly think if, look, if this election is over and it's clear that Donald Trump has lost, uh, even if it's messy getting to that point, he's gonna leave. Uh, and we, we've had statements from uh, people like Mitch McConnell uh, and, um, uh, even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that suggest no role for the military here. Mitch McConnell made it clear we will, we always have, and we will honor the results of the election. I think if uh, if it's clear that he lost, it'll be very, very hard for him to uh, stick around, and and I think he'll go off and create the Trump Broadcasting Network and uh, um, continue to be a force in American politics. Honestly. Uh, but uh, but I, I think the other the only question I would have is actually whether he would show up at the inaugural. I think that might be a legitimate question. But as to is he going to leave? Yes. And I, you know, of course, I I I really uh, have to be careful about speaking about the Constitution because my old constitutional law professor Gerhard Casper's on the phone on, on this Zoom here. But uh, as I understand it, under the Constitution, as of you know, now, it's January twentieth. That, that you are no longer president at noon. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, that, you know, you kind of turn into a pumpkin at that point. And so there's probably not the way Gerhard would have described it. But, uh, uh, but I, I really don't think that's a risk. Thank you. So we do have a couple of minutes left. I don't want to uh, keep you for too long, but we, there's still a, a large number of questions. Um, here's a fun one. Uh, what would be the top two topics on the agenda of the first post-election call between Chancellor Merkel and either A, President Trump or B, President Biden? Maybe let's you know, vary the question a little bit so it might be easy for you to answer. What should be on the agenda of that first phone call? Uh, well, Emily, why don't you go first? <laughs> What would you like to see on the agenda? Um, well, the first topic would be congratulations <laughs> to the winner of the elections, uh, as is uh, uh, um, uh, practice. Um, I think the next topic should be uh, that both sides need to come together as uh, quickly as possible to define the three or four areas uh, on which we would like to move forward. We've mentioned some of them already. Uh, and um, in order to produce uh, early uh, and visible results, that would be important for, uh, for the bilateral relationship. And certainly uh, dealing with China uh, is among them. Yeah, that sounds right to me. I think if it's a... Uh... Uh, President Biden, uh, obviously beyond the congratulations, my, my guess is there would be um, a desire to, uh, if not come over personally to Germany uh, shortly thereafter, we do have the Munich Security Conference coming up, which Vice President Biden attended a number of times and Senator Biden attended a number of times. Uh, but uh, if not coming over to Germany uh, quickly, certainly having senior members of the White House and the administration uh, come over to begin to uh, work quickly on that framework that uh, Ambassador Haber just suggested would be uh, a topic of conversation in that first phone call. I think it'd be, we need to get to work quickly, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we would like to end this call on a positive note, and I would like to ask both of you um, to uh, tell us and to, to tell audience, uh, our audience, why committed uh, uh, transatlanticists can be hopeful uh, for the next years. What would be your kind of positive outlook for transatlantic partnership? Why is there still, you know, uh, reason to be hopeful uh, with regard to this historical partnership? 
Um, John, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, and uh, it, it, I mean, I, I'm looking at this list of uh, participants. You have over 350 people here, people on both sides of the Atlantic many of whom uh, are friends of mine, friends of ours. And, um, uh, and that to me is indicative of the extraordinary, uh, not just interpersonal, but institutional relationships uh, that have been knitted together and uh, uh, over the years, over the decades, uh, in the wake of uh, the Second World War. And that relationship that we have built and the institutions that we have created to sustain and grow that relationship have been largely responsible for an extraordinary, probably unprecedented period of growth and prosperity in, in our respective worlds. And uh, I see absolutely no reason for that not to continue. You know, the fact that you've got 60 million Americans with German heritage, uh, the fact that um, uh, you know, most Americans, if you, if you ask them to uh, identify a foreign leader, they can probably only name three or four people. It would be certainly Putin, probably Xi, uh, and Angela Merkel, maybe Macron, but that's pretty much about it. And if you ask them who they're, they think the top world leader is, it's going to be Angela Merkel. I mean, Americans love Germany. And, uh, and Germans, maybe it's not reflected in the polls because of these tones and all that, but I think there's a, a fundamental sense of connectivity uh, to the United States. So it's in our interest. It makes sense in terms of our, our shared values. And we are continuing to build upon the personal relationships that will ultimately sustain it. So I actually feel pretty good about it. Thank you. I look at, at the time we're living through as a period of transition. Now, if I discuss the transatlantic relationship, many of my interlocutors seem to think that this is a very uh, static affair. But in truth, uh, uh, our bilateral relationship has changed a lot over the years. It was Germany was a pariah in the beginning. It changed uh, when it uh, slowly re-entered uh, the uh, international community supported by the United States. Then in the early 70s, uh, uh, there were indications of a more independent foreign policy. All of that came with fits and starts and then uh, reunification. And it hasn't basically changed over the last uh, 30 years. So perhaps the uh, the sense of disruption we see, and it happens for a reason, it happens for the structural paradigm shift in the international architecture uh, um, may produce uh, um, a new balance in the relationship. Uh, and as John pointed out, he pointed out all the, uh, well, the intense fabric uh, of, our relation, uh, of our relations. In 1989, uh, when I was working at the Soviet desk, I remember that uh, um, uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, came to Germany and the streets were lined with people full of uh, uh, enthusiasm. They were applauding, etc., cetera. And um, it, it was incredible. And I thought at the time, I had an eerie feeling because I thought, how is that going to translate into all this euphoria? How is that uh, going to spell out? And it became pretty much clear that because uh, this fabric did not exist, uh, in, uh, um, problems would loom much larger. But in the transatlantic relationship, uh, we have um, the close interwoven links and fabrics and webs uh, of uh, contacts uh, that will exist uh, no matter what, uh, uh, whether we disagree about North Stream or uh, burden sharing, it exists. And I think that is uh, along with my first observation that transitions happen uh, and we'll have to adapt. Uh, it's normal. Thank you so much to both of you for uh, you know, leaving us with this uh, uh, glimpse of hope. Uh, this is really what we need in these days. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our listeners. First of all, really thank you, Ambassador Emily Harbour, for taking the time for joining our call. Thank you so much, Ambassador John Emerson. It was a great honor uh, having you both. Uh, we really covered a lot of ground. Uh, thank you for your differentiated and thoughtful remarks in your analyses. It was great to have you, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue with the both of you, of course. Uh, and uh, of course, looking forward to continuing this series uh, um, that uh, is called Road to Election. So looking forward to the next episode. Thank you again to all our listeners and uh, good evening. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.